Okay, so um, this talk was supposed to be light and pedagogical, but then I thought that I had some learned uh, audience, so finally I added some more technical stuff, but then I removed it and then I added it. So you'll see it's a mix, finally. And then there's a breach of etiquette. I, um, I saw that the name of this conference has the name Primes, and then I wanted to talk about the Möbius function. So I'm sorry, but I guess you know that any, uh, any progress on the Möbius function can be accounted as a progress on the primes. And anyway, I'll be talking about primes in about 10 minutes. I just can't help it. So there's no, no suspense. Huh? No suspense and no... Ah. Excuse me. That's not the good one. Oh, wait, that's going to be fun. Uh, Well, it it's starts in the same way. That's normal. OK. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially this theorem. Uh, you take the trigonometric polynomial of the Möbius function, and uh, you look at it at uh, the Möbius function multiplied by exponential 2 i pi n a by q. You assume that uh, q is uh, uh, not too large, but still fairly large. And uh, you want some cancellation. So what are the features of this result? Well, the trivial bound, uh, when there's no cancellation at all, is x. And what we save is square root q. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a bit uh, later what I like about this theorem. What I'll be talking about is about some history around this kind of results. What is the counterpart for primes? Uh, I'll start just in two minutes about uh, on a surprising consequence. And then maybe I'll talk about the proof. And maybe I'll give some news on bilinear decomposition on the Mobius function. That was the title, but finally it got pushed farther and farther away. Um, most probably I'll end up with that. So wh what is the feature of this result? Well, uh, it's x upon square root q. It's not x log x upon square root q. There's nothing in, uh, in x. The saving is only in q, so it is valid even if q is very small. Uh, another feature is that q can be as large as x to the 1, 9. I, I didn't try to, uh, to improve on the 1, 9. I mean, I just wanted to have a power of x. So it's valid till a power of x. Um, and then... Uh, my guess is that the square root of q is somehow optimal. I'll tell you that in a moment. It's optimal if you don't want to get the field middle. OK, so if you improve on this square root q, I'll tell you that you can get marvelous result. So uh, let me start with a consequence. That's a bit difficult. Um, it's, it's about Ziegel 0 or exceptional 0. Uh, the interesting part is the one in the middle. So what I'm saying is that in case you have an exceptional zero, take a modulus q, you have all the characters, you know that all the zeros are a bit far away from the line real part of s equal to one, except maybe one that may be closer to the point s equal to one. Uh, it is called exceptional, sometimes I will call it Ziegel zero. And uh, how you detect it? Well, that's the theorem of Hecker that I put at the beginning. If L1 chi, uh, the value in 1, oh, this 0 is associated with a real character, and it is uh, simple and on the real line. So uh, if L1 chi, there should be absolute values here, is less than constant upon log q, 
then you can find a zero, uh, beta larger than one minus C2 upon log Q. Uh, there's a small change in that. I added the factor Q upon phi of Q. Uh, that's something I proved uh, recently in a note. Uh, that in fact, if there's no exceptional zero, the lower, the lower bound for L1 chi is Q upon phi of Q upon log Q. It's just a, a tiny improvement. Maybe it follows from the work of uh, Graham and Ringrose, but I've not been able to uh, compare both, uh, both results. So now, how to detect that you have a Ziegel zero? Uh, you look at L1 chi, and if it is less than Q upon phi of Q upon log of Q, then you have one. And uh, the, the corollary that I'm interested in is, if you have a Ziegel zero, then call it beta, and look at the residue I mean, look at the value of the derivative of L at beta, then this result tells you that it cannot be close to zero. It's at least a constant. Uh, the, there's a, a result of Pins in uh, um, 1976 that tells you that uh, if L1 chi is small, so if you have a Ziegel zero, then the derivative uh, in one is fairly large. So if you know that the derivative in one is fairly large, and if you know that beta is close to one, and if you can control the second derivative, you know that the derivative in beta is also large. But since the second derivative is of size log cube, Q, you could lose a little, uh, a little part. I mean, you're sure that if beta is closer than one minus one upon log cube Q, then the, second, the L prime beta is going to be large but not if it's farther away. There's another result of flow that I, that I quite like. Um, if the derivative of in one is uh, less than one, so you um, look, I'm, I'm looking at the size of the derivative, uh, then automatically L1 chi is larger than uh, one upon log Q, so you don't have any Ziegel zero. That's uh, uh, fairly amazing. Um, Okay, so less technical things. I want to ask you who these people are, because the first one is Vinogradov. No, I, I have to tell you about the history on, uh, of uh, estimates on, trigonometrical, on the trigonometric polynomial on the Mobius function. And the fact is that there's not so many uh, uh, results in the literature. So, um, of course, Vinogradov in 1937, he produced his work on sums of three primes and he produced a way to control the trigonometric polynomial in the primes. That was a real awesome thing. And uh, in 37, Davenport, uh, he must just have reached Cambridge. He was, he was young. Uh, it must be his first position in Cambridge. He, he immediately recognized uh, the power, and he did use something for the Möbius function. So the way he did that is, is fairly interesting. So what he does is that uh, he says, OK, let me divide the integers in three classes. Either the integer n has only small prime factors, but there's not many of them, little o of x. Either the integer n is a large prime times a small kernel. Well, it's essentially like primes. Vinogradov has results on primes. I get them for this, for this part. And then what he ends up with is the integers that have a not too large prime factor multiplied by a large integer, which is a bilinear part. So he ends up exactly in uh, uh, Vinogradov had said, what is interesting with the primes is that you can write the characteristic function as a linear combination of uh, easy terms, that I'll call linear terms of type one term, and bilinear term. What uh, Davenport does is that he immediately gets the interesting part of the uh, uh, Vinogradov result. He says, OK, I'll get the primes plus a bilinear part. And this bilinear part is already studied by Vinogradov. So finally, the proof of uh, Davenport is, uh, is two pages long. It's just extremely efficient. Uh, subsequent development on the Mobius function, that's folklore. People know that it can be done. 
but it doesn't appear in uh, in uh, in books. It appears in the book of Karatsuba and Voronin. Uh, I mean, an identity appears, but no result is given. Uh, I, I I don't know of any other place where you can find uh, results. Okay, so I, I told you that it was folklore. And uh, because usually we look at what happens for the primes and not for the Mobius functions. So what is the equivalent of the theorem I stated for the primes? Here it is. So lambda of n is a von Mongol function. Essentially, it's a log of p if uh, n is a prime. Um, and look at this trigonometric polynomial. The bound you get is uh, 14,000 square root q upon phi of q times x. The trivial bound is x, so the saving you have is square root q upon phi of q. Essentially, if uh, q is a prime, uh, it's 1 upon square root of q, something like that. Um, so wh what are the, the features of that? Well, q can be up to a power of x. I didn't try to optimize the power of x, I just wanted to, to have a power of x. Um, the method I'm going to present is fairly flexible. Uh, it, is a, it is based on a bilinear decomposition and uh, on some barbon and V of weight. And it is explicitable. I mean, you can compute things. Uh, of course, the constant 14,000 is fairly large. I didn't try to get uh, an optimal constant. But I said, instead of writing in my paper, uh, you can compute the constant. I said, OK, take two, three weeks and compute the constant. Uh, so it is 14,000, which is easier to, uh, to say than to say this constant is explic explicitable and it's easy to do it. Uh, when I say that it is sharp, uh, is that uh, if you change the 13,000, which is the 14,000 now, uh, this 14,000, if you replace it by 1 minus delta, say by O.99, then you prove that there's no z equal zero. And when I say no z equal zero is none at all. I mean, it's not that the z equal zero is pushed away from one. It's that it's pushed as far as one minus constant upon log q. Uh, the, um, if delta is a function that goes to zero with q, then you can shift it less. But, uh, so it's, it's extremely sharp. And that's what I was telling you when I was telling you that it's optimal. It's not optimal because there's no z equal zero. Okay. But till you, if you improve on this result, you show that there's not. Okay, now some history, uh, but for, for, the, for the prime part. Uh, the, the first result I finally discovered in the book of uh, Vinogradov. Uh, it's, it's, excuse me? Uh, no, I don't have it. <laughs> so there's a very complicated theorem in Vinogradov, and if you take the parameter in a good way, you finally discover that he gets uh, the bound for the trigonometric polynomial on the primes to be less less than x times log q to the 10 upon square root q. So it doesn't depend on x, on, uh, yeah, on x. It goes to zero like q. It's not optimal. There's still a log x to the 10, a uh, log q to the 10. Uh, OK, there's some limited range. It doesn't go till power of x. But it, it, you can adapt that for the Möbius function because it relies only on bilinear form, which I'll, I'll show you later what, what it is. Uh, Karatsuba, in uh, his book, uh, that's a picture of Karatuba. Uh, got the, the bound square root q upon phi of q, which is optimal. Uh, but he uses analytical means. I mean, he uses an explicit formula. He uses zeros and residues and so on. Uh, I don't see how you can adapt that for the Möbius function. Um, Eddie Daboussi, who you can take his picture, is over there. <laughs> Uh, worked out an improvement on Vinogradov's uh, result. He got essentially tau of q log q, q to the three half upon uh, 
Uh, there's, a, there's a square root of q which is missing. Uh, okay, there's a q and a... F um, anyway, it's 1 upon square root q times a function which is small enough if q doesn't have many divisor. It becomes bad if q has lots of divisor, but if, it's, if q doesn't have many divisors, it is much better. And uh, what I uh, and you can use the method for the Mobius function as well. It's flexible. It's a bilinear decomposition. Uh, what I did in 2010 was to get the q, the square root q upon phi of q, so optimal, in a decent range. Well, not power, but I was not so unhappy with that. Huh? Uh, but the fact is that I. I went through some um, uh, Bombieri asymptotic sieve, uh, and one of the essential arguments in that is positivity. So I used an identity, that's true, and, uh, but to study the error term, uh, I use heavily the positivity of the uh, von Mangold function. So it's valid uh, for von Mangold function for primes, but it's not valid for the Möbius function. Um, so I'm, I'm just telling you a bit about uh, uh, explicit result, because there's an explicit part in the result I'm stating. Um, so Wang and Chen, so Tianzi Wang and uh, Jingong Chen, that uh, Jingong Chen, uh, started working on explicit results. There's many different papers. I, I chose to, to cite this one, uh, 94. Uh, Eddie Dabussi and Joel Riva tried to see what they could get uh, from an explicit point of view on this polynomial. And uh, the results were not very convincing. Just like the one I showed you, the 14,000 uh, square root q upon phi of q, it's, it's not that it's not very convincing, it's that it's bad from a numerical point, point of view. It exists, which is uh, the good part. But you cannot use it just like that. You have to do some work if you want to, to use it. And, uh, of course, uh, Harald Helfgott uh, worked on that uh, because that, that he needed some estimate uh, like that for the three primes in, uh, for, to show that every odd and large integer and quanti quantifi quantifiably large integer uh, is a sum of three primes. He uses a trigonometric polynomial on over the primes and he needs explicit estimates, so we get much better estimates here. Uh, and this work, all of that, uh, as far as I can see, applies to the Möbius function. Um, OK, let me give you another proof. Ah. OK, let's try to see whether we have done something or we haven't done something. Uh, there's a very famous theorem, which is Gallagher prime number theorem uh, from 1970, which is this theorem. Um, so in this result, take h equal x. This result has two features. You can take h to be a power of x with a power less than 1, and the q, the capital Q, modulus till, whom, till, uh, till which you, you go, can be also a power of x. So if you look at this, uh, at this uh, theorem, well, it gives you uh, about the results you want for the prime. So take capital Q to be the modulus you want, your little q, and take it small enough so that the exponential log x upon log q is small. And uh, you will get exactly the... the uh, estimate I, I mentioned. There's a, um, th there's a uh, um, little difficulty here. It's uh, the heart that I've put here. If you have an exceptional zero, you have to remove the contribution from the exceptional zero. But for the primes, it's not a problem because you can handle uh, the trigonometric polynomial for, for this part. And that's exactly what gives you the square root of q upon phi of q. Square root of q is, in fact, the Gauss sum for the exceptional character. And phi of q is because uh, you average over all the residue classes. Um, 
So uh, how th is this theorem proved? Well, there's been a long stream of results on uh, density estimate. Huh? And um, so this density estimate, finally, uh, somehow we wanted the power of t to become as small as possible. And then it, it was seen that it would be extremely interesting to have them very, very sharp next to the line real part of s equal to 1. Uh, Linux started that in 44, 47. And uh, um, Gallagher uh, finally had the idea of putting the idea of Linux with the idea of the density estimate and produced uh, this exceptional theorem. How he does that? He takes an explicit formula for the uh, psi function, for the distribution function of the primes in arithmetic progression. So with zeros and residues, and then uses a uh, uh, density estimate to, to bound the, the terms. Uh, what you need in this approach, uh, well, you need the residue of your function as the zeros. For the primes, it's very easy, because the residue is one. It's not one. The residue is the multiplicity, but you always count the zeros with the multiplicity. So in fact, you don't have any problem with the residues. For the Möbius function, the residues are a nightmare. Even if you assume that all the zeros are simple, the residues is one upon the derivative of L at this point, and you don't know whether it is small or large, you don't have any idea about the size on average. That's why what I told you at the beginning, L prime beta chi large, it tells you that the residue at the exceptional zero is large enough. In fact, that's one of the consequences. Um, so if you take Gallagher's proof, you say, I cannot make it work for the Möbius function, because it uses zeros and, uh, and uh, residues, and I don't know how to do. But you can do it. Uh, that's Gallagher on top. Uh, so how can you get uh, Gallagher prime number theorem for the Möbius function? It has not been done, uh, but I think you can believe me that it can be done. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. Uh, um, so in 1970, Gallagher got his uh, marvelous result. And uh, in 1972, 73, Selberg uh, started working on that. Uh, in 1974, uh, Bombieri wrote a book, I mean, gave a series of lectures in the Collège de France and wrote a book in which he told about some of this work made by Selberg. And um, then uh, Yoshi, uh, Motoyashi started working on that. Huh? And he finally got a proof of the Gallagher prime number theorem without any zeros. The, the idea is exactly the same uh, as. Uh, um, you know, the bombier vinogradov theorem, we used to prove it by using density estimate. And then in 1968, Gallagher said, OK, you can use a uh, wonderful identity. And you can derive this theorem directly without going through to the zeros. And what Moto Ashi does is exactly the same. So you start from a formula. You go in the zero free region, but you don't take any zeros. Then you do some transformation, and you get, as a narrow term, exactly what you need. So this time, you don't have any zeros, and you can apply it for the Möbius function. And it works. I mean, I'm pretty sure it works. I'm going to write down the proof at some point of time. Or I'm going to ask someone to write the proof. <laughs> it works, it works, uh, well, it works almost. Because in the uh, Gallagher prime number theorem, it works except for the exceptional zero. So you have to take out the contribution of the exceptional zero. And here you have the residue, which you don't control. Um, there's a second problem that I, If you do that, there's a slight blemish. And the result you get is larger by q upon phi of q. Um, I'm very surprised that there should be this difference, but uh, everything I can think of brings a bound which is slightly larger. I mean, q upon phi of q, it's log log q. It's not much larger. 
But still, since I'm looking for optimal result, it's, uh, it's a bit surprising. Okay. So uh, I'll tell, I'll give you some element of the proof, uh, which I've called pre-proof. The, the first part is uh, Barbon and Wehoff weight. Uh, these are th this function here. So you take lambda one, it's a Mobius function for d less than z. For d larger than z squared, it's zero. And in between, you take a, a smooth variation by uh, log z squared upon d upon log z. So it's one in z, it's zero in z squared. And this function has a marvelous property, which is this one. So if you take the summation for n up to x of this lambda d square divided by n, then it is less less than constant, which I, I computed, uh, log z upon uh, log x upon log z. What is, uh, what is remarkable about that uh, is that you can have uh, x to be as large as uh, z to be as large as x. You see, if you have this one, d is less than z square. Yeah? If you open this sum, what will you get is a modulus d two moduli d1 and d2. So you have the LCM of d1, d2 that divides n. But the LCM can be of size z to the 4. Yeah. And so you'll, ha you'll get an error term, which is potentially of size big O of 1 times z to the 4, which is z to the 4. And your main term, if you discard the divided by n, the main term is of size n. So it easily, what you get is that this estimate is going to be true for x larger than z to the 4. That's easy. The difficult part is to cover the range from z to the 4 to z. In fact, uh, Barbon and Veoff wrote a, I guess, two pages long paper uh, in which they said, OK, you can do that. But they didn't exactly do it. I mean, they say, uh, you can do it. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Sidney Graham, I think it was in his dissertation, uh, wrote a proof. So his proof is that if you take this lambda d square, don't divide by n, it is equal to x upon log z plus a big O of x upon log z square. And then uh, Motoashi got an analytical proof of that. Um, in fact, uh, re recently I got a, a, a fuller proof of that. Because you may want to have a second term. So uh, you have an asymptotic estimate. It's x upon log z. And the error term is x upon log z, log z square. But you, you may ask, can I have get a better error term? x upon log z to the 10, for instance. In fact, there's a secondary term. And then after that, you get the error term of the prime number uh, theorem. Um, which means that now, now uh, we can uh, localize this between x and x uh, in an interval of size x upon log x, something like that. Anyway, uh, Motoashi uh, discovered that uh, in this matter, we don't need uh, an asymptotic estimate. The only thing we need is this function divided by n and an upper bound. And that's simpler to obtain. Uh, I did quite a lot of work on the Mobius function from the explicit side. And uh, that's how, finally, I got this 5,200, uh, 5, which is bad. I mean, I'm not happy at all about this uh, 5,200. I can tell you that one year ago, I was, uh, I was not able to put any constant. So in fact, I'm fairly happy with this constant. It's not yet usable. It says that maybe there's a way to... Uh, to uh, to achieve uh, a better constant. Uh, the condition x larger than z square is absent should be x larger than z4 is absent, but anyway. OK. Ah. That you are not going to like. Uh, I'm sorry that the uh, previous version of the slides was as a mistake in this, but anyway. So. I said I'm going to tell you about bilinear decomposition. 
And here is uh, bilinear decomposition. Uh, my aim is this one. Okay. My aim is to produce an identity for one upon zeta, the generating function of the Möbius function. It's someone, it's going to be my bilinear form, plus something easy, plus something trivial. Uh, I just have to tell you how, how these things are, are being done. So I need a, a, a first guy over there, it's VR. So you put this barbon and they have weight, uh, some for D device N of lambda D. Yeah? This one they tell you, in fact, that if N is less than Z, uh, you don't get any contribution, except maybe for one, N equal to one, but I've removed it. And I multiply by the Ramanujan uh, sum CR of N. That's the idea of, uh, of Selberg in 1973, in fact. I'm going to tell you why uh, I do that. And uh, I introduce this MR. So MR just believes that it's a variation of summation of mu of N upon N to the S. But it's a variation that includes a modification with this uh, CR uh, Ramanujan sum. And what you have is this identity. Uh, uh, VR over, over there, if you open the convolution upon D, you see what it gives. You see a, a zeta factor coming out. And since you have, to, you have removed the, the terms n equal to 1, you add it. You have 1 equal minus VR plus zeta r times someone. And this someone is, the variable n is bounded in this someone. It's less than r times z square, it's bounded, it's a small one. Once you have that, you multiply it by 1 upon zeta. If you want to work with the primes, you multiply it by zeta prime upon zeta. And what happens is that your 1 upon zeta when you multiply it, so 1 times 1 minus zeta is the one you want, Minus VR times 1 minus zeta is going to give this coefficient, is going to be your bilinear form, huh? because you're sure that n is large enough. And zeta MR, well, the 1 upon zeta, that was the one that was giving difficulties, disappears. You multiply zeta MR by 1 minus zeta, you just have MR. And with that, huh, right now you just have uh, polynomials. So, uh, I'm... The, that's the identity I used. The identity used by uh, Motoashi is this one. Um, it's only the square, in fact. You write 1 plus VR square, and you look at uh, what you get. OK, uh, maybe it's going to be more interesting in uh, functional form. Uh, functional form, is the one you want is this one. Sum of mu of n, f of n. And in my case, f of n is exponential 2i pi n a by q. So that's the one you, you want here. And you decompose it into two terms. So this one, if you look, k is less than z. z is a small power of x. It's small. l is less than r times z square. r is less than a small power of x. It is small. And here, you have the variable m, which is free. So if you have cancellation, if you have information on your function f, you know how to handle this part. This part is a type 1 sum of Vinogradov. It's a, a linear sum in a terminology that I prefer. The other part, the other part has a, Well, the main feature is that you have two variables, L and M, and both of them are large and small. They cannot be too small. They are all larger than Z. They cannot be equal to 1, no? and they cannot be equal to x. They are all less than 2x by z. Uh, as soon as you have one that, that is large, the other one is not going to uh, and It means that here you really have two variables, and you can really use a Cauchy inequality and hope to save something. That's the bilinear decomposition uh, uh, that was sought by um, Vinogradov. And we have this additional. Ramanujan sum CR of M. For the time being, I'm just, I've, just, I've just told you, choose a R, and I've not used the average of a R. I just say, OK, I have a family of decomposition, and um, 
when R is fixed, you have that. Okay. I can see that you're still alive. So I'm going to start a bit of the proof. A bit of the proof, the polynomial you want is the black one here. Some of mu of n exponential, I mean, E n a by q. And you multiply it by a summation of a r. Yeah? And capital R is a small power of x, the x to the 1 upon 100, something like that. Uh, your first step is to use uh, the previous decomposition. The linear part is very easy. See, you have the summation of f of klm, m was free, and f is this function exponential a n by q. It cancels, I mean, there's lots of cancellation. It's a geometric uh, theory. There's no problem. The difficulty is with this bilinear one, which is this one. <coughs> the first thing you do is that your variable l and m we are between z and x by z. z is typically x to the 110, and x by z is x to the 9 by 10. So what you do is that you split that into the adic interval between l and 2l and so on. How many of them do you have? You have log x of them. So maybe you've lost log x. And remember, at the end, you want something optimal. You don't want to lose this log x. Um, OK, you have your coefficient. And look at the variable L. The variable L doesn't appear anywhere. So finally, you can sum for L in an arithmetic progression modulo M. And what you get is that this AL makes the variable B here and means that you can get a summation upon B. The, um, The variable L makes the variable A rotate. It gives you an average over all these classes. Uh, in between, I've used Cauchy's inequality to, uh, to get a square. And so uh, our aim is what? Our aim is to save on the summation upon R. Just now, we've added a summation. We've lost the log x because of the dyadic decomposition. And we have to save the summation upon R. And that's done by a in fact, fairly simple, I mean, uh, by a theorem of large type, uh, which is this one, which is essentially due to Selberg. Uh, uh, it has uh, quite some history. Uh, let's say that it's uh, ideas of Gallagher that led to this uh, kind of result. But the fact that we use uh, Ramanujan sum in between is really an idea of Selberg. So you see, you have your sum upon R, yes? And here you have m plus r squared t. m is as large as z, and r square is much less than z. So m is much uh, m is dominant, and r square disappears, which means that you've saved the summation upon r. And the summation upon r was in log x. So you've lost log x by dyadic decomposition, and you've just saved log x by this result. Uh, you also have an integration upon t, but it's not very... You can get this result uh, with dt, but in fact what you need in the proof is dt upon 1 plus t, I mean 1 plus absolute value of t. So essentially it's t around 0, which is important. Uh, the integration upon t is not so crucial. What is real crucial is the summation upon r. And uh, so I put the, the 43 in red because, uh, you know, I wanted to compute this constant. And all the constants were bad at the beginning. Uh, if you take uh, Gallagher's proof, the constant you get is 500, about. When you take Gallagher's proof and compute things, blah, blah, it's not so, so difficult. You get 500. And uh, finally, I managed to get to this 43. I don't have any idea as to what is the optimal constant. Can, I mean, is it larger than 10? Is it larger than, uh, than uh, 1 upon pi? I mean, I, I don't have any example in the reverse direction. And I don't have any conjecture about what, well, what should be the good answer. Maybe it would be better to put a coefficient in front of the m and a coefficient in front of the r square. I couldn't get an anything optimal here. Um. 
OK, so if you use the method in a simple way, use the same kind of identity, remove the barbon and V of weight, remove the Ramanujan sum, and see whether you can get something. Well, it's very easy. I did that for my working group uh, last week. <laughs> That's why I put the result here. Uh, very easily, what you get is that this trigonometric polynomial is x times some power of log. It was for a working group, so I didn't try to improve on anything. And the denominator is what you expect. So it's a square root of either q if q is small, either x by q if q is on the other side of square root x. Uh, and I still don't know whether it's an improvement on the earlier result or not. Uh, the fact is that what we find, uh, I mean, what we expect from uh, the literature is to get this result plus x to the four-fifths. That's the one I can, I can find in uh, the book of uh, Ivanietz and Kowalski. Uh, that's the one uh, I expect. I don't know whether by using other identities you get something uh, better. The fact is that with this result, you get x to the one-half to the epsilon. Uh, so it's an improvement when q is just in the central value around the square root x. That's almost the end of, uh, of the talk. Um, maybe just... Just a bit. Uh. Ah. I didn't know it was there. <laughs> okay, so how to prove, uh, I told you at the beginning that uh, one of the consequences of the first estimate I had given to you was that the residue at the exceptional zero of the Mobius function was large. How do you prove that? Now you have two proofs. You have the proof I've given, and you have the proof of the Gallagher prime number theorem by, uh, where you remove the contribution of the exceptional zero. Compare both. Since Gallagher's result tells you that the main contribution is going to come from the exceptional zero, and since I have a proof telling you that this contribution is small, compare both, and you discover that L prime beta chi cannot be small because otherwise the contribution from the exceptional zero would explode, that's all. Um, it's if, if you remember the first result, it was stated that L prime beta was larger than Q upon phi of Q, but that's not what I was able to get, Q upon phi of Q to the power one minus epsilon. So Q upon phi of Q is already log log Q, not much larger than that, to the power one minus epsilon is the epsilon is really a, a difficulty here that you would like to remove, but that, that I can't with this, uh, with this proof. Um, no, no, this one I don't want to, to tell you about. Um, something else that you can do with the, the proof I have, uh, we know that we can prove that there's no Ziegel zero if we know that the average of an all A modulo Q of the sum of L congruent to, well, A modulo Q of lambda of L, the lambda function, if it's less than uh, 2 minus delta x square upon uh, x square, upon phi of Q, we know that there's no Ziegel zero. So I wanted to get a similar estimate with the Möbius function and not the lambda function. And this one tells you that if you have an L2 average estimate for the Möbius function, so L2 by Q divided by some power of log Q, then you know that you don't have any Ziegel zero. This statement is, is uh, it's, a, it's a first statement. I would like to remove this log Q to the C11. I would like to get C11 to be equal to zero because I more believe that the proper statement is L square upon Q. And uh, in fact, uh, L square, uh, there's maybe some, uh, if, if Q is a, is a prime, that's what it should be. Uh, otherwise, there's some, it should be a bit smaller than that. Um, okay, and end. No, okay, end.
the I, I showed you at uh, at the beginning that Gallagher's prime number theorem was valid not only for an interval between x and 2x, but only for also for an interval between x and x plus x to the theta, with theta strictly less than 1. And since the kind of technique I use are, are similar, uh, it's clear that you can do the same for the lambda function. You get an estimate. And you can do the same for the Möbius function. Uh, and I told you also that uh, I had some loss with this integration upon t. And uh, I told you that in the proof, I get dt upon t. And uh, I can prove a much better large estimate than that. Uh, so finally, if you, if you look, you can get this average estimate, uh, which is um, most probably optimal, uh, uh, with a smooth transition between q, t between being less than q and t being larger than q. But uh, after that, it becomes uh, too technical, and it's time to go for lunch.